G'day. Welcome to Lunch Money. Uh, we are the online and social media home for special situations, workouts, and capital raising professionals. My name's Nick Samios. I'm the director and fund manager here at Hermes Capital, and uh, I am your podcast and live stream host. Uh, so a very warm welcome to you. Well, uh, businesses that uh, have done it tough during COVID uh, have managed to hang in there. We're not seeing anything like uh, the insolvencies that have been predicted. Um, well, so they're, they're, they're hanging in there and, and the numbers are very good in terms of uh, insolvencies. Um, JobKeeper has had a role to play. But don't expect that to change a lot when JobKeeper comes off. If you were watching Warren Hogan on our podcast last week, uh, he made the comment that there's a lot of savings buffer in the system. Um, and that savings uh, buffer, he believes, uh, will kick in where JobKeeper left off. I certainly recommend to you catching up with that, uh, that episode last week if you missed it. Um, and the savings isn't just household savings. Um, I, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to have my first session on the new uh, social media platform Clubhouse this week, and uh, one of the people there was saying that apparently Treasury has a mechanism for monitoring the interest earned on business uh checking accounts and by monitoring uh, by monitoring that interest they're able to determine uh, that businesses uh, also seem to have a lot of savings uh, in fact earlier this morning uh, there was an article in the AFR reporting that cochlear will be returning 24 million dollars uh, in jobkeeper payments uh, voluntarily and they're joining uh, Nick Scarly Dominus Pizzas and others uh, who'd already uh, returned 50 million collectively um, so that sort of gives you some indication that there's a bit of buffer in the system um, so maybe instead of uh, businesses seeking to restructure formally through the assistance of, of formal appointments of administrators or, or, or etc uh, maybe they'll be looking to restructure informally that is to continue to trade the business normally, um, but to, to bring in a hired gun uh, to basically uh, bring the business back to where it should be. So I've got two special guests today to, uh, to talk about that. We've got a professional hired gun in Michael Millwood, and we've got Neil Cusson. Uh, we'll have both of them on very shortly. I do want to uh, remind you at this point in time to uh, share, like, or subscribe. Hit the share button, hit the like button, um, and, uh, and help us get, uh, get our message out there. Uh, secondly, I'll also remind you that the best question or best participation uh, of the day will win one of these lunch money mugs. Without any further ado, let me introduce our first guest. And our first guest is Michael Millwood. G'day, Hi. Michael. How are you going? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Now, Michael, uh, I've known Michael for some time. Uh, he, he's a pretty down-to-earth sort of a guy. And whilst he has had some very senior roles, obviously CEO roles uh, in some pretty large businesses with, with some pretty large turnover, uh, he likes to simply describe himself as a hands-on fixer and problem solver. Um, so, um, and, and uh, I guess we've got him on because, as I say, he, he takes on these informal roles where he gets uh, brought into the company either as a CEO to to lead the business through through a phase, uh, or as a or as an advisor. Um, tell us, Michael, uh, what what uh, what is it that keeps you busy lately? And maybe tell us a little bit about your experience as a as an informal uh, hands on problem problem solver. Yeah, sure. Look, so. Um I suppose uh, the projects that I'm looking after at the minute is for a, a, a fairly large organisation. We've got a turnover of about 250, 280 million and um, over 1,500 people in the workforce. And it's, uh, it's, it's a good business and it's profitable. However, you know, it's, 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 it's missed its heyday. A lot to do, I think, with the change in the market over the past 12, 18 months with the uh, effects of, of COVID. And it's interesting your comment before about how uh, some businesses are absolutely thriving and are sending money back through. And I think there are some unusual peaks. Supermarkets, for example, are having a heyday. The logistics companies are having a heyday. The pizza companies, the home delivery propositions. Uh, I don't think that will last forever. Um, there's voids in other businesses uh, that will be waiting for their, uh, for their day to come back. And I think there's going to be a, a, a big difference in the sales models uh, going forward with the new learnings of, of digitalization. And um, that's what's keeping me busy at the minute, taking over those transformation projects. Right. And uh, you, you've been at this for some time, haven't you, uh, in terms of, uh, of getting these sorts of engagements? Ooh, about uh, about 15 years um, in between 
working with insolvency practitioners on uh, administrations, um, which is kind of the, the next stage after if a, if a, if a turnaround doesn't work, <laughs> um, it'll, it'll perhaps land there. Um, but ultimately, yeah, about, about 15 years. And uh, I think uh, you, you've done laundry businesses, uh, wholesale distributors. I mean, what are some of the businesses that you've, you know, what sort of industries have you dabbed, dabbed your hand in? You know, um, I, I ran a turnaround uh, form of a small investment bank where we were um, using the South African uh, fund. Uh, I ran a pallet company that was just out of seed and uh, got it to profitability, then uh, sold it to some private investors. Um, I've uh, run logistics businesses uh, following that. Commercial laundry um, was another proposition for that was a long term proposition for a client to, where somebody had uh, somebody had died and um, the, uh, the the owner was left um, you know with his hands tied, not knowing what to do. Um, I took a role in in Sydney for um, a large B two B distribution company, which um, was had had ten years of decline and. Uh, we stopped the decline and got it into growth and packaged it and sold it to a competitor. And, and I'm now running on an overseas project uh, in, a, in a similar environment, but, you know, it's, uh, it has a very solid balance sheet, very profitable. You've given us some very interesting points to get through when it comes to uh, the early stages of an engagement and, uh, and, how you, and, and how you go about doing what it is you do. Before we go to that, I think we'll just uh, introduce uh, Neil Cusson. So I'll just put you in the waiting room there for, for a few minutes, Michael, and we'll just bring uh, Neil Cusson in, our other guest panellist. G'day, Neil. Hi, Neil. I'm well, thanks. Thanks uh, for allowing me uh, to join you today. Now, Neil, uh, the first thing that people will notice is that it's Neil Cusson Core Quarters. So uh, people will be dying to know what it is that's been keeping you busy the past week. Yeah, look, I, I think the market's pretty well aware that last uh, last three weeks I've joined uh, uh, Core Quarters. I wanted to uh, to move to, uh, you know, progressive boutique uh, reconstruction insolvency forensic advisory firm and uh, be a bit more nimble and agile in the market and uh, probably be able to serve my clients a little bit better in that regard. and. Uh, you know, it's a, a bit of a new world with new legislation and uh, new opportunities around uh, around that, uh, and you need that sort of uh, um, agileness to 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 respond to the market and the conditions of that. I mean, I don't necessarily want to sort of name names, but some of the, you know, the biggest of the big four accounting firms in the UK are either offloading or have offloaded their restructuring divisions. I mean, what what do you make of that? Well, I think, look, it's a little bit different there in terms of the, the law, in terms of the opportunities and uh, and, and the market slightly different. It's a, it's a very large market there compared to Australia. But here I think um, there's still vital roles for um, turnaround professionals, reconstruction professionals and insolvency professionals to, to blend together to get the right results for different organisations at different times depending on their, their circumstance. Um, and do you think is, is it necessarily something that we'll see here? I mean, I, I can't imagine. Um, you know, I can I can certainly imagine some merger and uh, M and A activity uh, in the insolvency space. I mean, we saw, you know, in, in days gone by, PPB being uh, acquired by was it PwC, uh, etc. But I, you know, well, so I guess I guess it does happen. Yeah, look, it does, and uh, it, it's a case that um, I think some of the big four firms do want to uh, build up their armory, particularly particularly in that. Uh, SME middle market where they've probably uh, you know, been missing out on work, and uh, um, but there is a lot of different um, competitors in the market to deal with all types of entities, and uh, the big four, you know, probably you know they're sorted for the for the big end of town, and uh, there's a lot uh, of uh, entities underneath that, and they need to be serviced differently. Is the, is the work at the big end of town, is it more informal engagement these days? I mean, obviously, you know, there's one or two, uh, you know, headline-grabbing uh, failures and insolvencies, but there's not a lot. I mean, is it, is it more in, are you sort of brethren in the big firm doing more, more informal work? There is a lot of uh, informal work, absolutely, and a lot of work that doesn't make the papers for the, for the, for the right reasons. And, uh, yeah, there's some really, uh, really good professionals in that end, that end of the spectrum that... Uh, you know, working very hard to uh, improve the the profit performance and uh, and uh, the asset uh, value of those organisations. Okay, and uh, you were talking a bit earlier about your concern around uh, around the advisor space. Maybe not necessarily so much at the big end of town, 
No, I think I spent the last couple of weeks um, noticing a lot of the uh, um, different entities having difficulties bringing along what I term and, and some of my colleagues in the industry term the, the new COVID advisor who is really um, using COVID as a uh, an excuse for, for either poor performance or, or problems. And, and of course, um, 2020 had its challenges and legislation and, and opportunities are there. But uh, you know, for instance, to argue that a, a company um, was trading um, insolvent in 2018 and 2019 because of COVID is just ridiculous. Um, and, uh, you know, we have directors sort of rely on COVID, but they, they have their obligations under the, the Corporations Act, you know, Section 180 to 184 on, on good faith and books and records and not um, using their uh, position for improper advantage and reckless trading. They, all those things won't, won't be saved from, you know, the COVID legislation. So people have to be informed around that and their advisors need to to understand that and uh, not go to meetings and just talk about the second half of uh, the 20, calendar 2020. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I, I, uh, I wonder if due to COVID is going to... Uh, become the new due to the GFC. I, I've said before that, um, you know, my, my um, you know, business development managers, you know, the, the GFC was an excuse back in, you know, 2010, 2011. But, you know, when you're looking at a business in 2015 and you're saying, why is the business struggling? Well, it's due to, due to the GFC. And you think, well, GFC, that sort of happened back then. But uh, I wonder if we'll be hearing due to COVID for uh, for years to come. I mean, COVID's not not over yet, of course. But uh, but that's an interesting point. Listen, let's uh, let's bring Michael back, and we will start having a look at his uh, his uh, formula here for the first hundred days as the turnaround CEO. Um, before we get into uh, into your your structure, your recipe for what it is you do when you get engaged, uh, Michael. The first thing that's got me interested is. For, for Neil to get engaged, you know, there's an event. Uh, the, the bank account's run out of money. The company can't pay its bills, literally can't pay its bills. Uh, it, and there might be some sort of legal action. You know, there's, there's no confusion as to whether or not Neil should be appointed uh, at that point. Uh, Neil would always argue that he should be engaged earlier. But that really brings us to the problem. People don't really like to face their problems, uh, either through, you know, wanting to save face, uh, we can do this ourselves, do we really, you know, if we bring in someone external, we're admitting defeat. I mean, what, how, do you, how do you get engaged early enough to make a difference? Well, I'm, I'm lucky that I've got uh, a good professional network and the most of my engagements have come through that referral pattern uh, through accountants and, and, and lawyers, um, more so than administrators. Um, and that's where that uh, good business people, good shareholders have, have taken early advice on board versus um, burying their head in the sand. Um, I, I think from a, you know, a, a turnaround is, is really a, uh, well, look, every business is different and there's no magic formula. Uh, it's more about understanding the set of circumstances. So, for example, you'll have some businesses that have just uh, have been a good, solid performer and have had one or two bad years and have lost their way and need to fix their management, which is deemed a turnaround uh, because they want to get back to the, the to the glory days. Um, is one option. Then you'll have another set of propositions where it's been on an absolutely uh, huge decline basis, getting towards the end of its tether, uh, and, it, and it's the, and it's it's the last. Uh, hurrah, uh, before it would end up with an administration, which is another form. Um, so, you know, they vary in, in each case. And my start point is always, what does the shareholder want? What are they trying to achieve? Are they looking for uh, sustainable results for the future? Are they looking for money back? Do they want uh, to balance it and package and sell? Um, there's, there's so many different aspects to it. It's not such a straightforward proposition. Um, I think the trouble with turnaround is it gets this he macro headline, uh, headline that makes it sound like it just rolls off the tongue and off you go and do it. Every business has complications and it's never straightforward and the devil's in the detail. I guess I guess what's what's sort of interesting me is getting the engagement. So I know that you've had some large companies. I imagine those engagements would come at the board level rather than necessarily say the CEO level. Like the CEO isn't putting up their hand to get replaced by you, are they? But maybe the, is it is it coming from the board? 
shareholder. Yeah. It's board, yeah, the board, the board do it, and uh, usually under the shareholder guidance or external advisor to the shareholders, saying you know you need to make changes, and um, they're brave enough to uh, to make the move and and back themselves. Um, again, you know my experience when I work with the investment bank was you know, the whole principle is that it's the people. If you've got people you trust, you get the jobs done. It's the people are right, the culture is right. You'll get your results, providing you've got the. Uh, the money to stump up to see you through, um, and that's uh, and that's the message. Um, so when I've been appointed, it's because they've recognised that they've got an issue, and and they'll ask for an opinion as to whether or not it can be a turnaround, or is it something that's you know would be recommended through to Neil. You know that's happened too. Well, let me ask Neil. Um, I mean, Neil, sometimes, uh, well, you, often you would see situations where it's pretty cut and dried that uh, that you need to be engaged. You know, there's insolvent trading and, and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, how how do you sort of delineate between, you know, because you, you, you're you like Michael or like myself, you know, you've got accountants and lawyers and other people referring you matters. I mean, how do you make a decision as to whether or not this is a matter where we need to bring in a hired gun to fix management? Versus, this is a matter where really we need to we need to actually give the business the legal protection that a, a formal appointment um, provides. Yeah, I think you've got to look at a couple of things, but but strictly first, I think it's the, the business fitness. You know, to use a uh, a, a common term, uh, and and that is really around your you see CEO and your CFO and your plan and how that that evolves. But what's been prevalent more in the last sort of 18 months plus is um, in that business fitness is um, is wellness and uh, the wellness and the, uh, of of the of the C-suite to you know have the acumen and effort and understanding um, to put the effort in to to look at that transition that turnaround that that adjustment um, from the the path that they're on are they willing to do that. And are they of a mind to do that? If that's sort of lacking, um, then the objective sort of changes, unless there is a, a large shareholder bo- um, base to change the board, that, you know, it's probably moving to some sort of sale program um, and how to extract the best value, the assets, you know, as they're re- recycled in the marketplace. So um, I think that business fitness is, is interesting. The second one is obviously the accuracy of the books and records to allow you to make the decisions that you need to as a uh, as a professional, whether that's um, um, turnaround, insolvency, reconstruction, or otherwise, is a and, and Michael's world is, is probably um, unique to my uh, to mine in terms. He's probably getting into some 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 larger end companies where the records can be relied on um, more to help make those decisions. If you're getting back into the sort of SME middle market, you may not have the accuracy that you would like to make the, the better informed decisions. And sometimes we see the financiers concerned about their positions because they're not getting the right uh, um, financial uh, information uh, provided by those C-suite um, directors. Yeah, well, that's interesting, I suppose. Obviously, at the SME level, uh, well, one of the things that Michael can do is he can tell the shareholders that the C-suite's rubbish, uh, whereas at the SME level, the C-suite is the shareholders and it's a bit of a tougher conversation to have. Listen, let's move through. So, Michael, you, you sent me some notes. And one of the first things you talked about, which I thought was interesting, was was culture. Um, and I, I always sort of, you know, oh, culture, not culture again. But you but you do think that that's important in when you get engaged what, as to whether or not you can you can save the situation? Yeah. And what look, do you mean by culture? Look, for, for me, it's, it's absolutely fundamental. If you think about what Neil was saying, when you see, um, you talk to the C-suite and have they got the gumption and the wherewithal to, to make the difference, that's the start of the culture. Um, because if you haven't, well, number one is having the right business acumen and the intelligence to do the job. The second is having the belief and, and, and the buy-in all around the table that you'll, um, you'll, you'll, you'll work all for one, one for all and get the job done. Um, I think there's a, an awful lot of box ticking towards the end of, projects when uh, when they're running out of steam and uh, people covering their backs versus uh, getting stuck in to, to fix the job. Uh, that, to me, is where the culture starts to change. I mean, every business I've gotten involved with, if you want to see a spike in its growth and its performance, it's because you've got the right people doing the right thing at the right time with the right attitude. And to put that team together, um, it, it, it takes it takes effort and commitment 
uh, and that's leadership. And the leadership follows once you've got the plan. So, you know, back to the, uh, it's interesting the comment about SM, uh, the, the SME market. Uh, you're right, when you're dealing with smaller businesses under 20 million perhaps, and it is the shareholder who is the director, they can be a bit dysfunctional. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. And that's why they have their own business. But, um, you know, it's a bit like telling an alcoholic they've got a drink problem. If you know how to talk to an alcoholic, they'll get it sooner or later. Um, and you can you can fix them. Um, and I think the first thing to do is uh, the accuracy of the records. One of one of my first points of call is um, obviously the, a, a very basic forensic on, on their finances and what the records show. But more importantly, have they got any form of documentation as to how they build their business? You know, is there a plan or is it just I wake up today and it's same old, same old? Because, again, sometimes these very simple fundamental propositions can be night and day to shifting the business along, just actually having a good formal plan and sticking to it, knowing what you're doing. All right, well, let's talk about uh, the, the nature of engagement. So, um, you know, you, you get engaged by the shareholders, you're given a brief. Uh, that brief might be rescue and build up is, is, is the, the words you've used. So you rescue the business and build it back up to, to, to form a glory or, or beyond. And uh, another kind of brief uh, is uh, stabilise and sell. So uh, where, where they're saying to you, and, and I, I think I remember a few years ago you had one of those where you you, uh, you you got the business to a position where it where it could be sold and sold for for good value. Um, so I mean, how do, how do those briefs vary? Uh, well, it, uh, it's all about time in the market and uh, and what's in a and what's in a shareholder's portfolio. I mean, some of the people I've dealt with um, have got you know they've got a variety of things in their pocket. And they'll want to go chase, they'll want the money releasing so they can chase the most profitable propositions. So um, that's where you get some sort of the package to sell because they want to release the capital, uh, get the best value back, use the money for something else. Uh, on the other side of the fence, you might have something where it's a great market to be in. It's just lost its way. And there's, uh, there's gold in them, their hills, as they say. And they want to go back down the mine and have you bring it back up for them. So it's, it's really about the attitude of the people. Uh, who's one you're looking after. I mean, I think that sometimes gets forgotten about um, at C-Suite. You know, the obligation of C-Suite is you're a custodian of the shareholder, aren't you? It's his money or their money, his or hers money. Um, your job is to look after the best interests um, of, uh, of, of everybody, inclu including shareholders and the creditors. You know, it's, that's your job. Well, you say that, uh, but of course you could be a, you know, if you're a director in the C-suite that's not necessarily a shareholder, you're concerned about insolvent trading and, and obviously safe harbours there to, 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 to look at that. I'm interested, Neil, from your point of view, I mean, when you get appointed, obviously, you know, it's all, it, it, the business is in crisis by very definition. If there's a formal appointment, that's, that's a crisis right there. But you know there there, are, there must be situations where the owner says or that you know the owner says look what we really want to do you know is is get this business into some sort of shape to sell it in the future so I can retire or whatever it might be or it might be listen we we really want to save this thing it's got some great opportunity we've come I mean how do you is that something that you take into account the actual longer term objectives of the owners beyond just the beyond the administration, and how does that affect the way you go about your business? Yeah, look, it's um, it's it's probably in a couple of parts there. It's um, obviously uh, you're meeting with the uh, the directors, um, the key stakeholders before accepting an appointment, and you know you do want to understand what the objective is and and what they want to achieve. You've also got to look at the you know the viability of the business and the sustainability of the business as well, and other external factors because whilst you'd like always wanting to take into account and, and understand the position of the directors I think um, you also have the duty of care to the creditors and and, and, and that and the shareholders as well but uh, so you really have to take into account what will be the path that best um, can be developed up and evolved to get the best result for the creditors now if that's a case where the creditors can be paid in full and there's some, some ways out for the business to survive um, or the creditors, you know, can take a, a compromise but still want to be involved and go forward, then you can develop up that, that objective. But there is sometimes a, a, a conflict in the objective of the, the director owner versus um, what the financiers and creditors want to achieve or need to have achieved. 
So uh, sometimes a bit of a tightrope, but um, uh, I guess under Australian law, there's all these obligations of, uh, of, of that external administration to to um, to support the latter, the, the, the creditor result first. But um, I think it's always an encompassed package um, to try to get the best result for all parties, get the best outcome. But um, sometimes that doesn't meet um, from the creditors, uh, the creditors' point of view versus the, uh, the director's initial uh, objectives. Yeah, I guess interesting because, I mean, your legal obligation is to maximise the outcome for the creditors, right? Um, uh, I guess I guess theoretically, then again, if the creditors vote, uh, if the creditors are willing to sort of uh, compromise their short-term outcomes for, you know, a longer term, if you've got a business that's been trading for 20 years and the creditors want to support that business because it's been good to them in the past and they want to see it still here in another 20 years. But there is, I guess, a balance between maximising the outcomes for the creditors, which really means maximising cents in the dollar that they get paid, versus, you know, that, that isn't necessarily always the same as maximising the long-term outcome? Yeah, look, uh, that, that's exactly right. And look, um, under Australian insolvency law, I guess the voluntary administration regime, um, it's it's supposed to be a short time frame. It's there. I think uh, my view is really a balance sheet restructure. If the creditors are able to accept a result there to keep the company trading, then um, you can actually spend more time on more of the, of the, the management restructure, the, the plan restructure, the business strategy. It's it's hard to change that in a uh, in a one to two month time frame. Whereas if you can have the balance sheet restructure, then that gives the the opportunity for the business to be preserved, jobs to be saved, but then putting the plan in place going forward. And I think if I I'm a little bit critical of the way forward after that under the legislation is, is, is keeping the, the administrator or a turnaround specialist involved in the business after administration to, uh, to keep it on the right track um, rather than the administrator um, doing his job, dealing with creditors, getting result, handing the business back and perhaps having no further involvement going forward and, uh, you know, problems of the past continue to exist or... Uh, or repeat. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, just curious, I mean, just as an aside, Neil, the the, the appointments under the small business reforms, uh, there's been a lot, there seems to be been some, some simplified liquidations, but we're not seeing a lot of these VA lights. As far as I know, there's been one. Um, do you think, is $1 million too low as a threshold for that? I mean, I'm wondering whether or not it should be lifted to $5 million. I thought it was a debate topic for future podcasts. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think it is too low. Um, it's it's pretty easy to have a, um, to run a business and have a more than a $1 million worth of liability. So I, I think it is too low. Um, there's the issue with that, you know, and that we're talking about SME, we're talking about small business there. and. I think the issues around um, having your employees paid and up to date, uh, you, you, all your tax issues lodged, um, and only have a million dollars worth of liabilities. I think sometimes they all, you know, can't be um, packaged up so that you can make use of that legislation. I think that's why it hasn't been widely used, and uh, um, the time frame under the new legislation. Sort of twenty days, fifteen days, you know, thirty-five days. It's 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 sort of the time, same time frame as a as administration process. Um, and I think that legislation would be better served with the administration going ahead, but having having um, expert turnaround um, and use your expression, hide guns to help help the business afterwards. Um, because I think some of the legislation, even the uh, simplified liquidation, is not that simple and you know, the same result can, can happen under the, the former legislation or the uh, the current the, the current um, credits voluntary liquidation uh, scenario. So, um, yeah, probably it's probably too hard, um, and that's why, uh, or too difficult to achieve everything um, under those rules, and hence why nationally, I think there's less than less than five. Um, Companies if, if there's five, I didn't. I haven't seen the other four. I certainly saw the yeah. one pop up, but I know it's less. I know it's less than five. Yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, what's today? Today's the nineteenth of February. So, you know, there's yeah, well into the second month, and yeah. no, no yeah. one's using it. 
All right, listen, Michael, getting back on to, to some of the data that you provided me in terms of what it is you do uh, when, you, when you get appointed, when you get engaged, I should say. Um, and you've said, I've just listed four things here. You've, you've talked about evaluating management, giving guidance to the leadership team, uh, developing a high-performance culture, restoring profitability. There seems to me to be a lot of things that you probably have to do at once. I mean, it, it's not necessarily one thing after the other after the other, is it? I mean, when Neil gets engaged, he's got a legal checklist of things that he has to tick off. Uh, but but with yourself, like you said, every engagement's different. I mean, how do you, you know, what, what is it that that's gets your, your first attention? Is it, you know, sorting out the management team? Is it, you know, is it you know, wandering around in the accounting department? I mean, and how do you prioritise those things? Do you know, it, it's, um, it, it's it, so this is what I find fascinating about these types of projects. I love them for the, uh, for, for the uh, I suppose, the, the speed that you have to act. And I, I, I like to think I've got a reasonably good commercial radar, which is followed by my, um, you know, what I classify as my business x-ray machine, which uh, is then backed up with my uh, business MRI. Um, and I kind of roll them all out into the operation at the same time. And, um, you know, it starts with my, with my um, with my smiley face and my questions, and um, they, they get put through the machine one at a time um, as I'm busy uh, deciding wh what, where we are within the market and taking the professional advice and help from obviously the accountants and the lawyers that, that, that are involved at that stage. That's kind of the triage proposition um, and understanding. Well, like I say, you're going to, you're going off the brief of what the, if it's funded of what the shareholder wants to do, then you're reporting back. Um, based upon what you've seen, and you've got your gut feeling, uh, which is made up of uh, your own calculations and some common sense, which is usually quite lacking in a lot of businesses, and um, pick, picking out the difference for people who understand uh, hard work and um, versus box ticking. Um, and tell me, how do you, I mean, when you, you get asked to have a look at a situation, I mean, do you have a few rules of farm of I'm not touching stuff like that? Uh, I mean, what is it that motivates you to, to take a role? And obviously, when you're offered to, to take on the role of a, a large corporation turning over hundreds of millions of, of dollars, uh, you know, you can, see, you can see how that's going to, uh, you know, how that's going to be financially rewarding for you. So, you know, financial rewards aside, I mean, are there some things that you just won't touch uh, or are there some things that particularly excite you? Yeah, look, you know, I think that's uh, that goes back to your ethics, doesn't it? I mean, again, it all starts to me with with what the what the shareholder values are. Um, I won't do anything that I don't think is right, fair, or legal. Um, you know, I want to look after uh, I want to look after my own interests as well as I want to look after the interests of the uh, of, of the company. Um, I'm not interested in I'm not interested in projects where I just know it's a it's a graveyard environment. I'm certainly not interested in things where they've got legacy issues and they and they're trying to hide. Um, you know, it's got to be all based upon uh, this this culture of honesty and, um, and and getting out of, well, not so much in trouble. I mean, sometimes these businesses aren't in trouble; they're going to be in trouble if they don't do something. Um, it's making sure that they've got the the, the right um, attitude to, towards uh, you know wanting to fix their own environment uh, it's it sounds a bit fluffy i'm trying not to be fluffy i'm trying to pick my words without being rude to companies i don't <laughs> think, i don't think directors wake up in the morning and think you know today is the day i'm going to go in and stuff up my business i don't think they do that um but unfortunately over a period of time if things have been missed and not been checked properly uh, and they've trusted other people which is usually one of the biggest issues and they've not gone back and checked that's usually where the, the, the trouble starts and I guess my job is to go right back to the beginning and um, and shake the tree for that. All right. Well, listen, we might uh, we might leave uh, your your guidance there and just have a look, a quick look at a few headlines um, before we before we wrap up for today. Um, I, it's, I've sort of picked through a few of them here, and I'd just be interested to see what what you guys think. Um, the first one is. Uh, rallying stock puts equity raising in picture for Seven Group. Um, Harris Farm and Superior Food Services in spotlight with Coles open for acquisitions. Uh, these are both from the Australian. Uh, from the Australian. Um, and the reason I've picked those out, I know this is something that I that I talk about a lot, but it, you know we are in a low growth environment. I think uh, businesses are looking to make acquisitions to grow. 
Um, and I just wonder, you know, Michael, when you get engaged, I, I remember you had an engagement a few years ago and, and I caught up with you and you said, yeah, we're now on the hunt for acquisitions. Uh, I mean, is that is that part of the whole process? Is that something that's on your mind in the beginning maybe as a way out? Yeah, again, you know, it's about picking up the strategy as to um, what volumes you're going to need to get to the, your maximum your maximum profits. Um, so acquisitions can form a part of that once you've got yourself back on the straight and narrow. Um, you know, I'm just thinking about uh, some of these things that you're flagging up there with the with the um, these supermarket things and and how they're looking to bolster on with these uh, with these other brands. I mean, I think that's just about market share grab, isn't it? And that's that's king at the end of the day. Well, I think they were saying that. Uh you know they had a very they had a bumper year with COVID, I suppose all those all those rolls of toilet paper and what have you, um, but they're they're not expecting those numbers to repeat themselves next year, and so they're looking at acquisitions uh, as as a way of uh, of keeping the numbers up. Neil, uh, do you have you ever been involved in a in an acquisition gone wrong? Someone's made the wrong decision when they've bought a business and it's brought the whole thing asunder. Yeah, look, I mean, I, there's always uh, M&A that I guess turns into or. Um, ends in distressed M&A and, uh, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, companies that, you know, they list um, for they think the right the right reasons and uh, if the business is not sustainable um, or has no viability, um, then um, it's not going to really matter. Um, but there is a lot of businesses that, uh, that uh, make the, the ASX listed, um, their business model is, is rubbish, but um, the market responds to hype and the FOMO factor and, um, you know, the share price rises and can sometimes, you know, nearly touch the ASX 300, which will trigger compulsory buying, you know, for businesses that really just aren't aren't viable. And I've been appointed to a number of those type of businesses and, uh, um, you know, what the liquidation ends in, little value except for litigation funding against the accountants the auditors and uh, and other other third parties who have uh, assisted in uh, in the, the raising that share price. Yeah, a lot a lot a lot of work there for the marriage counsellors and um, uh, and, li- and litigation funders. You think possibly down the track. Uh, okay, our next headline again, just on this theme of low growth environment. Um, you know, obviously with our borders closed, you know, I- I- immigration people coming into Australia. The numbers have dropped. I can't remember exactly how much they've dropped by, but obviously we don't have uh, people coming into the country the way we used to. Uh, you know, and we, certainly where I am, there's apartments going up all over the place and you wonder who's going to buy them. Um, and I do know that when I have looked at the at the liquidation data, there does seem to be an awful lot of property development companies in there and construction-related stuff. It, firstly, I wonder, is that what you're seeing, Neil? And um, do, do you do, do people say to you that they're concerned about low migration affecting business? Yeah, look, there's been a lot of development um, in Western Sydney, premised on the back of um, Chinese money, particularly. You know, that, um, according to our property team, it, it, it's a case that people in China generally wish to purchase uh, or invest in Sydney, if not in Sydney and Parramatta. Uh, rather than uh, than in Brisbane and Melbourne, and that's sort of been key in the past. And uh, we've seen a lot of development in Parramatta, which is now coming off, I think, in relation to residential development because of that 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 migration. So there is a number of uh, development companies in that in that sort of Western Sydney precinct that um, probably finding a little bit more distress than they had uh, twelve months ago. And what about you yourself, Michael? I mean, obviously, um, you, you know, you, you've been involved in all sorts of businesses where I'm sure that migration rates have maybe fed into, you know, future projections of sales and what have you. I mean, what what do you think? I think it's, I think it's timing issues. I think, um, you know, the, the, the whole world has been on anaesthetic for the past 12 months. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if, it was, if it was Australia on anaesthetic and the rest of the country, the rest of the world was... Kicking along, I'd say it was a it was a deeper problem. I think there's timing issues for people on their cash flows on on these building projects, which is very sad. But I do think it'll pick back up because ultimately, um, you know, we're a, we're a, uh, a country built on on migration. I mean, I saw a, a fabulous speech at the Union Club about a year ago about the history of migration into Australia, um, 
uh, you know, and it's uh, the numbers. Are, the numbers have been huge of, of recent times, and I think that will continue to bash forward um, once we get through. Once we get through this pandemic. Well, I, you know, I keep saying it again and again, but I think that uh, there's no doubt that we, we, we're very lucky uh, to be here in Australia with, you know, with, with the way you see most of the countries through Europe are in lockdown still. I've got uh, in-laws in, in Ireland and, uh, you know, you, I certainly wouldn't want to be there right now. Um, so we, we, we certainly we certainly have been very fortunate and I wonder if that's going to make uh, make people uh, m- more more interested in, uh, in coming here. Interesting comment from this side of the pond. So a very good friend of mine who um, very successful property developer, he's building somewhere in the region of about a thousand apartments in uh, Manchester as we speak. And I had a conversation with him the other day and uh, said, you know, yeah, are you worried? Are you? <laughs> and he's like, no, he said, he, he, not at all. Um, it, this, you know, he's absolutely unshakably confident this thing will come roaring back through just like people will come back to work, believe it or not. They want to go to an office. Um, you know, I know there's a male point of view that says the girls say they don't want to and the boys say they do. I genuinely believe people will come back to an office and they will live in apartments again and enjoy the good life in the CBD. Well, so we, we certainly have so. Listen, we'll just very quickly touch on this last headline that grabbed my attention uh, 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 over last weekend, it was, in the Wall Street Journal. Borrowing binge reaches riskiest companies. Um, and we've talked before uh, on lunch money about the capital overhang. There's a lot of money out there. Low interest rates. We talked about low interest rates last week. Uh, means that there's a lot of money looking for returns. And I guess what that article is talking about is that, that now companies that would not normally be able to easily raise uh, debt capital are finding it easier and easier. I mean, I think one of the comments was that there's an excess of demand for bonds. In terms of investors, there's an excess of investor demand for bonds uh, in terms of supply, and uh, certainly when I look at the Australian situation, uh, certainly investable companies, uh, there would be uh, not enough investable companies for all the money, all the money out there. I mean, could this? What, what, what do you think? Uh, this? Did you see this as a, a a problem down the track, Neil, or what? What's your take on that? Well, I think money's cheap. I mean, that's what you've, you've pointed out uh, the last uh, last couple of months on, on this program. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's going to change any any anytime soon. And, you know, bond rates are low and, you know, 30-year-old bond rates are low and, you, you know, um, you know, the effect on retirees is, is significant. Um, but the, these companies, um, and the share market particularly, they've got to put their their money somewhere and you, you look at uh, uh, the All Ordinaries, it's, it's going to be at a level next month of where it was when we hit uh, hit COVID and you look at, well, how can that be if the underlying profit of, uh, of our companies um, hasn't been there? But obviously, there's some companies done very well under difficult circumstances, but, uh, but not that many. So uh, it'll be very interesting, I think. What about yourself, Michael? When you get uh, engaged in a, in a situation, I guess, Obviously, you're looking at the availability of funds. There's a lot of cheap money around. I mean, does that affect the way you, that you go about your business? Look, I think um, a couple of points of view. I think whenever there's cheap money around, I mean, some, they, they, they want to place it, don't they? I mean, they, they're looking for some form of return and activity. Um, they have to create activity because they can't sit on the money that they've raised. Um, it's a problem for them. Do I? I can never find it when I'm looking for it, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> All right. It's always available on the right days. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there. Just out of curiosity, what uh, what time is it where you are, Michael? It is 10 to 2 in the morning. 10 to 2 in the morning. So a very, very special thank you to Michael for uh, getting his IT to work, and he's looking fantastic there. Uh, in, you're in the office at uh, 10 to 2 in the morning, are you? I am. I decided, you know, I would work late and get some stuff done, you know, and I will, um, I will take an early mark. Tomorrow being Friday. All right, well, well, Michael. I, Michael, I think it's uh, it's too cold to go outside, and that's why you've stayed in the office. It's a it's a beautiful twenty seven here in Sydney, and what is it eight degrees where you are? It's it, it, it was raining the the last night I looked outside, and I, I must admit I have a very comfy office, and I'm halfway to do I pull up 
on that couch and just throw the doodle over and, and uh, fry her in the morning. <laughs> all right, well, why not? All right, well, uh, Michael Millwood, that was a, it was a privilege to have you on to make uh, make the effort. And Neil, it's fantastic to catch you up after we've yeah, been a little thanks, quiet man. there for a little while. It's good to good to see you uh, with you uh, be, be behind the desk again. And thank you very much to uh, to all of our viewers and listeners. And uh, we'll do it all again soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, Cheers. Th th thanks for having me, and I look forward to seeing you back in Sydney soon. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers, Michael. Yeah.